hold it facing me because I'm going to talk for an hour. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if your hands are going to want to hold it that long. But, um, okay, so we're going to talk about that part first. So that's going to be the problem solving part. And we went through a couple questions last uh, week. So it's going to be similar to that. Every day is going to be a little bit different, so you won't have the same as Mondays and Wednesdays. We'll have different ones too. But don't ask them because they don't get the chance to ask you, right? So shouldn't be asking them. So on that part, and everybody's going to kind of start at different stations, so people will finish at different times. The longest part will be the part making the x ray. So it'll be on the the x-ray will be up on the view box over there, so I'll print it, and I'll have everything that went into making it. And you'll have to like look at the technique, and you're gonna use math to fix it. So you're gonna use the math problems to fix it. When you, and we're gonna use the CR plate, so you're gonna enter in the computer. Your banner ID is gonna be the patient date, I mean patient number, and then your name, and then you could just make up a date of birth. And then you'll select the histogram and everything. So it's just gonna be one view. After you make the exposure, if anything is inappropriate, like you'll write about it, because you're gonna write a justification of what you did. Um, you need to make sure that you have your markers, your dosimetry badge, because you wouldn't be able to even make the exposure if you didn't have your dosimetry badge. So the kind of the first thought process on that is going to be thinking about is it overexposed or underexposed and you're going to look at that s value over there on the chart so that chart will be available to you so remember if it the s value is high so we have a high number that means it's underexposed and then you will double your mass or increase the kvp you don't do both you only do one okay if it's low S value, that means it's overexposed. And on that one, you just divide your mass by two. I didn't put the KVP up there because really that's going to change the patient dose. So the best answer would be to divide the mass by two. So then once you get that technique, you're going to um, plug it into your next math problems. So let's say it was um, overexposed. We would divide the math, the math by two, take that new number, and then figure out if we have to do a SID change. So using this formula, mass one over mass two equals SID one squared over SID two squared. And then you take that new mass again, and then you plug it in if you needed to use a grid. Not everything will you be in a grid, so you just kind of think about that too. So our rule of 10 centimeters or more will be in a grid. Or even thinking about like the knee, we did learn it in the grid. So if it's a knee, I do it in the grid. We need to remember that our grid is a 12 to one, which equals five. So any questions on that part? No? Okay, so then the rest, we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna go through our labs. So one of the easy ways to study for this will be to go through your lab journals. So, um, especially like on the written questions. So the written questions, could be from the lab journal. So like you could fill in a technique chart or something like that. On the other stations that they'll be, they're gonna be pretty much looking at radiographs. So for an example, like if you had a station that had quantum noise, what would that radiograph look like? Grainy. Grainy. So it could even ask you, what caused quantum noise? What would that be? Yeah, so too few photons, like a low mass or low KVP. 
you could have a station where you use the caliper so you um, might and thinking about the questions related to the technique chart so you're going to have a body part and it might say okay what's the minimum kvp to penetrate this part so what do we do yeah so you would just measure the part thinking about what you've learned of where you measure and then times by two plus 40. you could have even in that station like it could have a question that says okay for a fixed kvp variable mass technique chart a pelvis was made at let's say 80 kvp and 20 mass and it measured um let's just say 20 centimeters and then it could ask you what technique would you use for this pelvis right here? And let's say the pelvis increased by five centimeters. What would we do to our technique? Because we're doing the fixed KVP variable mass. Yeah, so we double the mass because that rule is for every four to five centimeter change in thickness, we're going to double the mass. So you'd use the same KVP and then double the mass. You could also have a station that has like a bunch of different x-rays and the first one's going to tell you what went into making that x-ray and then the other ones are going to have changes. So it might say, you know, in relationship to the first x-ray, um, which one has an object to any distance? So what would that x-ray look like? Yeah, so like taking the concepts that you've learned and then being able to compare different views. So the OID image would look bigger. It could have one where, um, let's say, it said they maintained the exposure but added a grid. What do you think would be the difference from the first one to the second one? Yeah, so like a higher contrast. So remember, high contrast is going to be more of a black to white image. So it's going to be comparing things and then doing a process of elimination of, okay, this one was that, this one was that. So like you would be having the letters, you know. A was this one, B is this one, that kind of thing. You are definitely going to have a station that you have to compare two chest x-rays on contrast. In your book on page 116 is two chest x-rays. And the chest x-rays are just labeled A and B, and then you could have questions related to them. So we did that in lab one of the times. And um, you'll need to be able to say like which one was low contrast, which one was high contrast, which is high KVP, which is low KVP, which is short scale and which is long scale. So remember to help you on that um, is that sentence of Las Cruces High School. So you always start with the KVP first. So low KVP high contrast, short scale. So Las Cruces High School, low KVP, high contrast, short scale. And then once you write that out, you can write the opposite. Everything's the opposite for the second one, which would be high KVP, low contrast, long scale. Remember the L's go together. Low contrast and long scale. The best way to think about comparing those two images is just look at them and go, okay, which one is black to white? So once you know which one's black to white, that's a high contrast image. You should be able to answer the rest of them just by 
thinking of that concept. Any questions on that? So I know station is just going to be kind of like a written. Yeah, X-ray. like it's going to say, it's like going to have two chest x rays and you'll just have to put A or B, which is high contrast, which is use the lowest KEP, that kind of thing. The one part that you will have to write more about is the part, the problem solving part, because you'll have to come back, look at your x ray, and then also write the math that you used and then say like because you're going to look at the s value again and let's say you didn't do it correctly but you knew what you did wrong you can write that or if you clip something you can address that kind of thing so um i'm going to talk about like each lab that we did this semester and um, what you kind of need to go back and review from So the first lab, um, we basically just kind of familiarized ourselves with the lab. Remember, on our x-ray tube, we have an anode and a cathode. And our room was kind of set up backwards. Which side had the cathode? Like, if, no, wait, let's see. Like, when facing it or? Yeah, we're facing it. Because when we turn it, yeah, it's on the left. Because remember, it should be on the bottom when you turn it, but it's up on the top. Um, we did, or started talking about the things that were important on the x-ray console. So, like, the prime factors that you can select are the MA, the time, the KVP, and the focal spot. What is the focal spot effect? Only one thing. Oh, the filaments. Which filament do you use? It energizes the filament and it affects the spatial resolution. So it only affects spatial resolution. Okay, so remember MA times time equals mass. And I know this kind of got some people even at the beginning of the semester. Remember, our time has to be in seconds. So if it's in milliseconds, you have to convert it. So if you have a multiple choice question on that, you'll have to remember to convert it. Um, We did the startup and the shutdown that day. You're not going to have to do a startup or a shutdown, but we need to understand why we warm up the x-ray tube. Why do we warm it up? Probably to prevent it from overheating. Yeah, so to prevent wear and tear, like if you just put too much of an exposure on the tube at once, and then to give us consistent images, so like to bring it up to where it needs to be. Um, and then we also made our first exposure in that lab. And I think we also did the heat unit formula. So heat units, what's that formula? It's the generator, is it the generator factor, right? Mm-hmm. Um, times mass. Yeah, so like MA times time times KVP times the generator factor. And it doesn't matter the order you do that in, just as long as you get them all in there. What is a single phase equal? Yeah, one. What about a three phase? Um, three phase is 1.35 and then the high frequency is 1.4. So it goes 1, 1.35, 1.4. Single phase, high, um, single phase, three phase, and high frequency. 
our system that we have is a high frequency. Okay, so then in the second lab, we had, we x-rayed homogeneous heterogeneous objects. So heterogeneous means it's made of a different material throughout, homogeneous is the same. We talked about a definition called differential absorption. What was that? Is that just the way that, um, or like the way the, the x-rays absorb through like different densities? Yeah, so it's, a, it's what actually creates the image. So some of the x-rays are absorbed in the body and some passes through. Okay, we did the anode heal effect. We talked about that during that lab and we did an experiment on it. What was the anode heal effect? So there's a greater intensity towards the cathode side, and why is there? Say that again. Is that where it builds up at the energy on that side to shoot over to the anode? Yeah, so remember our target has an angle on it. So the reason that there's more intensity toward the cathode side is just because, let's say this x-ray hits right, or this creates an x-ray right here. It could absorb right in that angle, where more are going to bounce off towards the cathode side. So more are going that way in comparison to this way. So the anode heal effect has greater intensity towards the cathode side, therefore we put the thickest part of the body towards the cathode side. And the reason that it has a greater intensity towards the cathode side is because there's an angle on the target and more bounce off towards the cathode side. Okay, so lab three, we talked about spatial resolution and distortion. So spatial resolution is our fine line detail. There's also another term that could be used interchangeably is called recorded detail. So in the past with film, that's commonly the word that we used to use, recorded detail. And now they kind of switched it to spatial resolution. So there was like a list that I put on the board of all kinds of things that will give us better spatial resolution. So let's talk about some of those things. What would give us better spatial resolution? Increased SID. Yes, that's one you have to tell us why. So if we increase the SID, why does that increase spatial resolution? Yeah. So it brings the size back to its true size, and then it also uses more of a perpendicular beam. So think about, remember the x-ray comes out in a cone? So if I come farther away, that beam is going to pass through that part perpendicular. Or if I'm closer, it goes like at an angle. Anything that has angles distorts an image a little bit. Okay, so Increase SID, increases spatial resolution. What else? Would um, using a grid increase it? No, that's kind of an interesting thing, but a grid doesn't change the spatial resolution. It gets rid of scatter and increases the contrast. Correlation? That also gets rid of scatter and <laughs> increases contrast. Decreasing the OID? Yeah, decrease the OID. So remember, we don't want the magnification, so we decrease OID. Um, focal spot, which one gives us the better? 
Small. Yeah, small focal spots going to give us better spatial resolution. Um, no motion, like we don't want motion because that will decrease the spatial resolution. Um, okay, what about some digital? So just thinking about digital images and how um, related to spatial resolution. What gives us better spatial resolution with computer stuff? What about matrix and pixels? Oh, so larger matrix, smaller pixels? Yeah, so small pixels, large matrix. So remember, inside the matrix are the pixels. So that kind of looks like some sort of grid, and the more you have is going to give us better spatial resolution. What about sample frequency? Yeah, so you want a bigger sample because that's going to give us more detail, right? Increase um, sample frequency is going to increase the spatial resolution. What about pit, pixel pitch? What is that? Is that the is that the distance between the pixels? Yeah, so like uh, one pixel versus another. We want them right next to each other. We want to decrease pixel pitch, which is going to increase spatial resolution. Um, there was something area, like the... The bit depth? Yeah, bit depth is like the area, so we want to increase bit depth is going to increase pixel resolution. Or was it something like pixel density or was it that we were trying to talk about? Something yeah, like my name and see I'm trying to think what was it pixel density? There was a word that talked about like the space of it. Bit depth was like the amount of like um, no. pick, or in the area, right? Area. Yeah. Okay. I think those are the most of the things that I can remember that have to do with spatial resolution. Um that same lab we talked about distortion and remember we have to keep size and shape distortion separate so size distortion has to do with what um, SID and OID yep SID and OID what about shape distortion Yeah, so different angles, so misalignment of the center ray with the tube, heart, or image receptor. And those are basically all angles, so misalignment of the central ray with the tube, heart, or image receptor. Okay, then lab four, um, that one, we started talking a lot about the digital images, and we 
went through the exposure index, you know you're going to have to use that on your problem solving part. We also talked about window width and window level. Window level has to do with what? Brightness. Yeah, brightness. And that's moving our mouse up and down. What about window width? Contrast. Yep, contrast, and that's moving the mouse back and forth. In lab four was the lab that we evaluated the two chest images. And I think some of you might have taken that picture too. So. So again, just low KVP, high contrast, short scale, and then high KVP, low contrast, long scale. In lab five, um, we talked about automatic exposure control, so we did the intro to that. What, and we had another lab that we also talked about AEC. But what does AEC do? Terminates what? Yeah, the time of the exposure. And we have three cells, right? You could have questions that ask you what body part or what cells you would use for certain body parts. So the common ones that we've talked about that have the two outer cells is the chest x-ray and the pelvis. Pretty much the rest of the things are the center cell. The abdomen was all three. What do you say the two words of the pelvis? The pelvis and the chest, the two outer. Um, in that lab, we talked about different exposure errors. So with the AEC, if we're not centered over the cell, we could get, like the image could terminate prematurely. So we, that would be underexposed. We also talked like about, um, like the ghost image that could happen. We also talked about the moray effect. What was the moray effect? And what causes it? Oh, um, was it when the fuzzy, like, you know, the grids, when they move? Kind of. It's when you don't have the moving the grid. Moving so grid. you okay. have a stationary grid, mm -hmm. and then the, you put the CR plate into the reader, and it has the same pattern as the stationary grid. So it's just like a random thing that will happen and cause that moray effect. I think of, um, you can get errors, remember, by collimating, like not to have four borders, or like if you only have two, sometimes that'll happen. It's not very common on that one. Okay, so chapter, or lab six, we went through quality control. And we, talked about um, checking the lead aprons. So how often do we check the lead apron? It's actually just annually. So you have to do it once a year. On the lead aprons, remember the way that they talk about them they use these words should and shall. So when we are in routine x-ray, what's our minimum lead equivalency? For? The lead apron. 0.25? Yeah, 0.25. So that is a shell, but it should be 0.5. So shall is a must. 0.25, but it should, like the recommended, be 0.5. For fluoroscopy, it's 0.5. So it's a higher, because you have the continuous beam. 
Um, so other things that we have talked about as far as quality control, automatic exposure control needs to be calibrated. Um, we talked about the half value layer and there is a requirement by law and this is a number you just have to memorize of how much filtration is needed. Mm -hmm. or 2.5 oh 2.5 2 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalent so we also did this so we tested our collimator so the collimator needs to be within 2% of the SID so let's say and this is just kind of a simple math problem like our normal distances are 40 44 and 72. So if they asked you um, what is the minimum like amount that you could be off for a 40 inch SID you would just do 40 times 0 0.02 and whatever that number is, is what you could be off on the source to image distance. Um, we did, and we even did this in the, the first week, but we talked about the time accuracy. So on um, our equipment, since it's a high frequency, they use like an ionization chamber system to test the timer. In the past, they used the spinning top test tool that was for the single phase. So the timer accuracy, and this is on page, I think 36 in your book, it said the max variability of exposures needs to be within 5% or less than for 10 milliseconds. So 5% or less for any exposure less than 10 milliseconds. On the KVP, the max variability is also plus or minus 5%. Then there was two words, and this is all, well, I think this is on page the KVP, I think, was on page 28, maybe. Actually, these page numbers, I think, changed since I wrote this. Um, but there's something called uh, mass reproducibility and mass reciprocity. So reproducibility needs to be within 5%, and reciprocity needs to be within 10%. And what that means is reproducibility means I set the same MA station in the same time. I made an exposure. I look at the output. I go back and I set the same MA station in the same time again. I look at the output. It can only be change within 5%. Mass reciprocity, that one is still using the same mass but you're using a different MA station in a different time. Because remember, mass is mass no matter how you get it. So you, let's say you set 10 mass with a certain MA station at a certain time, and then you went back, and then you can still get 10 mass with a different MA station in a different time. You set that, and that needs to be within plus or minus 10%. So if you get percent questions, the majority of them are 5%, but the reciprocity one is 10% and the KVP one is 2%. Any questions on that? Um, the cassettes, remember, they need to be erased if they've sat between 24 to 48 hours without an exposure made. So it could be something that you do just the first thing in the morning. A 
Okay, the next lab was the problem solving one. And we went through that, so hopefully you understand that, what we're doing on that. If not, um, come talk to me or ask somebody in the class. Okay, then on lab eight, we talked about grids and um, scatter control. So our sentence was scatter, anything that gets rid of scatter, increases contrast and decreases exposure. So anything that gets rid of scatter increases contrast and decreases exposure. So there's different ways that we can get rid of scatter. We can get rid of scatter production, which is before it reaches the patient. And things that get rid of scatter production our most common thing is collimation. We also have those past things that they had, which were cone, cylinder, and the aperture diaphragm. The aperture diaphragm is just that piece of metal with a hole in it. Um, so those all get rid of scatter production. So before it reaches the patient. The grid gets rid of scatter after it exits the patient, so it's not in the production part. So, if I say I increase collimation, what's happening to the light pill? Or it's getting fine. Yeah. Because we we want to increase the collimation, okay? There was a lab experiment that we did where we had the cassette all the way open, and then we collimated down to like a smaller size, like a five by five box. So if we significantly increase collimation, what has to happen to mass? Yeah, it increases the mass, but it doesn't say like you need to double it or doesn't give you amount, it just says that it needs to increase. And so thinking about that concept, anything that gets rid of scatter increases contrast and decreases exposure. So if it decreases exposure, we'll have to increase the mass. Um, in that same lab, as we were talking about the grids, well, of course you need to know the grid formula but we also talked about grid cutoff. So there were some different ways that we could get grid cutoff. What were those? Off level, um, off center. Off focus, or not focus, something like that? Yeah, so off focus is outside the correct SID. So off levels, like at an angle, off center. And then there was one more. Upside down? Yeah, the upside down grid. So the upside down grid, you need to be able to recognize that. So that will, you'll be able to see through the center and not through the outside, right? Because it'll be cut off. The Moray effect is also kind of considered grid cutoff because you're getting those grid lines like that. The other word for the Moray effect was, started with an A. It's a -lizine. A-L-I-A-S-I-N-G. And I'm just telling you that because I saw that in a question one time and I'm like, well, what does that mean? So, um, okay, so what does scatter look like on an image? Fog. Fog, and what color is fog? Gray. Yeah, so it's gray. 
Okay, lab nine, we talked about automatic exposure control again. So remember that terminates the time of exposure. So there are two kind of systems that you can have. You can have automatic program radiography and automatic exposure control. They're usually combined together. The automatic program is giving you like the recommended technique for that body part. So you just select the body part and then it has the KVP, MA, and time. But you can have that combined with the AEC where it has a longer time and then it terminates when there's enough exposure there. There were two types of AEC systems. What were they? No, that was a fluoroscopy. Oh. That was an automatic yeah. digital converter or something like that. Um, it is the photomultiplier tube. Oh, and then the, um, the photomultiplier tube. And then an ionization yeah. chamber, which we, we use like that oh, similar kind of thing for the time. So ionization chamber and photomultiplier tube. Which one is the one of the past? The photomultiplier? Yeah, the photomultiplier tube, so the PM tube. Where is that cell located? In front of the IR or in the back? The photomultiplier would be front. Yeah. yeah. Or it's in the back. back. So think about this. The photomultiplier tube is in the past, so it's going to be past the image receptor so it's an exit type that one is it goes to light first and then the electrical charge like trips the timer the ionization chamber one that one is in the front so you could think of that we use that now it's in the front the other one was in the past um, that one is talks about a gas air chamber if you see that in the questions okay so then lab 10 that was the one where we made the technique charts so we just need to kind of know a couple different memorization things for there so you could fill in a technique chart course we already said we the minimum kvp to penetrate apart which is a centimeter times two plus 40 what is our rule for fixed kvp variable mass for every 45 centimeter uh, change in uh, body part thickness you either or you change the the mass by a factor of two mm -hmm. And then the opposite one for variable KVP fixed mass. Um, that one's for every centimeter change in thickness, we plus or minus yeah. uh, the KVP by two. Yep. And then, of course, just the last lab, we went through the problem solving again, and then we talked about fluoroscopy. So again, like just kind of reading through the lab journals will help read through these notes that you took. You sound like you guys took good notes. It's kind of interesting because <laughs> you guys really haven't had to take notes in a long time. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I was thinking about that, like when I was in school, like I'd sit there and write and write forever. <laughs> and um, you guys don't have 